The last few years have seen a massive discussion around online misinformation, whether it was the 2016 US presidential election, whether it's been misinformation around COVID-19 or indeed right now, misinformation around the vaccines that are rolling out. So we want to dedicate this show to how do you go about tackling online misinformation? It's a very big, sprawling topic. It's not just one form, but we're going to try and break it down. But I think it makes sense to, to start at the beginning. So I guess this week, Cameron Wilson from Business Insider and Gizmodo and Ariel Bogle, analyst with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Where does online misinformation, at least in general, broad strokes terms, where does it start? It really depends on what the misinformation is because we see, you know, throughout anti-vaccine misinformation, uh, QAnon, they really build off past tropes, even tropes that go back uh, centuries. So if somebody sent me a Facebook post that had something they were curious about, I mean, I would just see if it fit into really familiar narratives around, you know, evil doing or something like that. But then I would dig in. So there are plenty of tools out there at this point where you can look at particular types of phrasing, see where it has repeated, try and track it back to its original source. Maybe it was a misinterpreted media report. Maybe it was a misinterpreted thing that a politician said. You know, it's really hard and really case by case. Uh, Just looking forward, Cam, if you were looking to curate, say, your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed, those are a lot of big um, social media platforms that most, that many of us have, what are the sorts of things you can do to clean up your timeline if you don't want to see that stuff? Are there things you can actually do as a user? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there are a lot of structural issues and things that platforms can do, but at the end of the day, you know, we all have a responsibility as social media users to be careful about the information that we're sharing as well. So, you know, when you're scrolling through your social media feed and and you see something that you want to share with other people, you should be sceptical. You should decide, you know, whether you're pretty confident that the content that you're seeing is legitimate because, you know, you have this responsibility. You're about to show, you know, all the people who follow you, you're about to show them this content and, in a sense, vouch for it. I always just say, like, if it seems too good to be true, it sometimes and often is, and you should always think about it. One of the major causes of misinformation spreading is that people want the information to be real. You know, they see something that confirms an already existing belief or bias that they have, and they share it as a way of affirming the things that they already believe. And so that, I think, to some extent, you know, turns off that little part of the brain that's a bit more sceptical, say, you know, the opposite situation where you see something that actually shows that whatever you believe is wrong, you're probably more likely to be like, hmm, I might just like, you know, look into this a little bit more. If you see a piece of content that really provokes a strong emotional reaction in you, it's probably worth examining this. People dedicate their lives to studying the cognitive psychology of this space. Uh, There's a lot of reasons why we share what we share. If I look at myself, I hold it very true for some reason that taking a cold shower is better than taking a hot shower. But where did I get that from? Is that from like my family folklore? Did I hear that on YouTube once? You know, there's all kinds of things in that category that really might start from a place of, you know, somebody truly believes that keeping your throat moist may help with the virus for some reason. It gets passed uh, Mm. to another friend, to another friend throughout families. And the motivation there is not necessarily nefarious by any means. It's about sharing and caring. So is this true? I'm not really sure, but I'm going to share it with my mum just in case because I want her to be (laughs) healthy and well during a pandemic. That's on one end. I mean, and then we can look at Uh, the misinformation industry, the people making money from it who have a strong motivation to spread it, all the way up into influence operations by foreign powers who, of course, also exploit certain types of disinformation. I don't want to put all the responsibility on people to have to build a healthy ecosystem for themselves, but there are options. Say, if you want to use Twitter better, you could try TweetDeck, where you can create lists of people that might share your interests in uh, cognitive psychology, for example, create that list, follow that list. You can certainly block words on Twitter as well and on Instagram. So there are those steps. um, But obviously, at the end of the day, there's a big picture issue here that needs to be addressed. Let's flip the script here a second here. What do you do, Cam, when you see somebody you know posting something that you think is a bit sus? What's the best way of executing that conversation? Do you leave it alone? Do you engage? And if you engage, how do you engage? 
I tend to engage, uh, but that's the, the person I am. I'm always up for a bit of a chat about something. And because, you know, I believe that people are often not spreading false stuff because they know they just may not have looked into it deeply enough or they may have misunderstood something or just believed it, you know. The cardinal rule is like, if you see something that you don't believe, don't like share it being like, is this true? Like, what do you guys think? Because you're continuing to spread it. Or sometimes, you know, even if you see information that's false, it's not always the best idea to then share it again and be like, oh, this is not true. Because that, again, encourages to spread it. And, and you know, maybe people who follow you will kind of see that and then decontextualize it and pass it on. So, yeah. you know, you can unintentionally make these things worse. But I think, you know, very often it's just worth having a quiet conversation saying, hey, you know, I'm not sure if you realize, but I don't think this is right. This is maybe why. People are often, you know, they want to do the right thing generally. Um, it's just they don't always know what the right thing is. Yeah. I mean, I do try and take the conversations offline or often. So rather than saying replying in the Facebook comments, I might try and do a direct message or even call the person. That's quite a full on step to pick up the phone to somebody and say, hey, I'm sure you share a thing and I think it might not be fact. I ch pick and choose. <laughs> Often I do that when I think somebody's getting actually scammed. Uh, so, yeah. okay. so I think mm. that's worth uh, picking up the phone when you think somebody is about to be parted for the, from their money in some <laughs> regard. All right, there is lots more of this. It's a half hour discussion on online misinformation. You can find it in the most recent episode of the podcast. Download this show. See ya. <laughs>